Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. We're going to take an ironic twist to today's conversation. Normally, we're talking all about speaking. Today, we're going to talk about not speaking, specifically the world of silence. And the my guests, yes, plural guests today, are Lee Mars and Justin Zorn, who are the authors of a book called Golden, The Power of Silence in a World of Noise. Quick background, Lee Mars is a leadership consultant who teaches experimental mindset. Yes, I said that correctly, experimental mindset at little known places like NASA, Harvard, and Google. And Justin Zorn is a meditation teacher and works at places like the US Congress as a policymaker as well. So they've got just a little bit of experience, certainly in places that aren't known for silence to say the least. So Justin and Lee, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having us, Laura. Good to be with you, Laura, thank you. Okay, so why am I taking this bizarre little twist in the road, this fork in the road? For me, what I wanted to bring to all of you out there is the what I view as a power combo. And my focus is on the accurate translation of thought into speech, taking all that genius that's up there and making sure that when you open your mouth, it comes out in the way that the listener gets it because they get you. Their focus meaning Justin Lee's focus, is on the value of silence to be able to translate that thought accurately so that when you do open your mouth, what comes out is as it sounded to you in your head in the first place. That is a, a golden opportunity, hence the title of their book, Golden, but that is an opportunity, it is a resource, the silence as a resource, that frankly, we don't tend to allow ourselves enough and I'm willing to bet that at this very moment, at least three quarters of the audience is nodding their heads fervently as they're listening to this introduction, like, yes, silence, what a lovely idea. I wonder what that would be like. So the, the power of silence in the world of noise, talk to us a little bit about why we need the silence. Why is it necessary? Laura, I love how you describe that about the accurate translation of thought into speech. And for us, one key value of silence is what we think of as discernment, discerning the thoughts we even want to think, having the space in our consciousness to be able to clearly perceive what's happening in the world, and having the space in our consciousness to clearly understand and articulate what we want to say to be able to listen to other people. What would you add, Lee? Well, I'm just um, thinking about the, the example we turn to of Gandhi, an incredible leader in our world. And when we did all this research, we looked to his work in particular because he chose to take every Monday in silence. And here he is addressing these incredible injustices in the world and taking you know meetings and conferences and you know in the thick of a very difficult time as a leader but he took every monday in silence where he did not speak on monday but he did take those meetings and attend conferences and he would go out into the world on tuesday his colleagues and friends said without notes and just drop incredible wisdom and be so clear with that time to discern what was really the important move to make in this impossible um, you know, uh, challenge how to, how to make his way through so that he could do that. You know, we're not trying to be Gandhi here, but just that such a historical, incredible figure would take that time, taught us that there's something here. There's something here to look at. And it's funny that you use the word impossible a moment ago, because I'm sure the the notion for most people, certainly working professionals nowadays of taking not just, you know, five minutes a day, but an entire day of the week, one seventh of, of your, your life at that point, and not talk, clear your calendar 100%, decline all meeting invitations, never answer your phone, not, or at least if you do attend the meeting, just to say, I'm not going to participate this time around. I would imagine that that is, uh, yeah, a little more than most people can wrap their brains around. But if nothing else, if he can do one day a week, we can find some time somewhere to work on this practice. And I'm certainly guilty of putting in thinking time blocks. I realized over the last year or so that I need to 
map those out a couple of times a week, 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there. But frankly, I'm not great at honoring that time, I will confess. So before we even get into it, cause just, this came to me now, so I want to address it now before that thought goes out of my head with the rest of the noise that's in it. Do you have any recommendations for if someone is willing and able to block out a period of time, five minutes, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever, of thinking time, of silence, meditative time, et cetera, how do you honor that without letting the rest of life eat it up? Hmm. It's an important question, and it's something we explore through various stories in this book, stories of people, maybe not at the level of busyness and intensity of Gandhi, but people in extraordinarily immersive careers and family lives. And we ourselves are, you know, living very full lives. I, I think I mentioned I have two-year-old twins and a five-year-old and working in politics and policy as well as mindfulness and some of these other topics. Lee is also in a very full engaged life. And what we've noticed in terms of making it stick, being able to keep to these commitments is for one thing, scheduling it and putting it in the calendar and treating this as an appointment with yourself to do something that is profoundly important, honoring it as though you're meeting with an important colleague or contact. And ultimately, this comes down to something that's deeper than just the question of how we hold it in our calendar. It comes down to the, the core reason we wrote this book was an intuition about the importance of appreciating these spaces of silence. The way we tend to measure productivity in our lives and even in our whole society, if you look at the way we measure GDP and economic growth in our culture, for example, we look at sound and stimulus just as we look at industrial production as value. But often the most value can come through periods of immersion in silence or a walk in nature when a new novel idea, real generative creative thinking can come up or time playing around with your children. It may not seem like something that's you know deeply productive in an economic sense, but if we look at where the most breakthrough thinking emerges, it's often in these spaces where we're not producing sound and stimulus. Yes. Anything you want to add to that, Lee? Yeah, we turn to Japanese culture and this aesthetic principle of ma. And this is a the kanji character is made up of gate and sun, as you know, Laura. Yep. <laughs> So that kanji character, the gate, and the sun pouring through the empty slots of the gate is what we at a temple say, is, is what um, we picture when we talk about this. And so there's this deep aesthetic principle that shows up in Ikebana flower arrangement and poetry and all the arts, you know, empty space versus that which is filled on the scrolls and things like that, but also in conversation as well, the pauses to really take in what someone says. And it really permeates the culture that there is this appreciation for the empty space that is equal to the appreciation, say, for the flowers in that arrangement or the, the, the calligraphy paint strokes or that which is said. So that the space, that empty space of ma, which is defined sometimes as silence or sometimes as emptiness, but also as pure potentiality pure potentiality. So if we are weighing to kind of get back to your point about how do I do this, if that space is more pure potentiality, if it's held in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds as pure potentiality, rather than just the absence of that, all that stuff, or all that wall of activity and things that we need to be doing, well, then we're going to hold it very differently. And that's why we turn to um, the concept of Ma in Japan to see how that is being held and to learn from it. I love that notion of the silence or the mob representing pure potential or potentiality. I think that's a very different way of looking at it. It's not that it's nothing. It's that it is the opportunity for something. It's allowing for that opportunity in a way that otherwise would not be possible. And it's funny in, in the world of rhetoric, we talk or public speaking at various tools along the way. One of the most powerful tools in your tool belt is silence, preg the pregnant pause. Oh, nice. Leaving, right? <laughs> leading in and just making people lean in and wait for you to finish. There's, there's that, uh, we need the resolution of the cord or we need something at the end. So when you make them want it, the, the silence, that sudden cut from the, there's a flow of the sentence 
and it just abruptly stops, there's that feeling of incompletion that is that we are often dying to fill. So they're waiting for that. Allow that space to, to really claim its power. I was just going to say, Laura, as you were demonstrating that pregnant pause, you can feel the intensity of that. And I think that's one of the reasons it's such a powerful and profound rhetorical strategy is because it does bring up a little bit of anxiety in people. There's that open space, that unfilled space. Who's going to come and, and fill it? There was a study at the University of Virginia back in 2014 where a social psychologist left undergraduate students in sparse rooms alone with no cell phones, no entertainment for 15 minutes. And they had a choice. The students could either sit in silence alone or they could push a button that would administer a painful electric shock. And at first, all the participants said that they would actually pay money to avoid being shocked with electricity because they were told how painful it would be. But by the end of 15 minutes, 67% of the men and 25% of the women actually chose to shock themselves just because it was so uncomfortable to sit in silence. Wow. <laughs> so it's like... This is something that runs deep. And in the book, we explore, we have a chapter called Why Silence is Scary. And we explore how Nietzsche talked about the, the horror of the vacuum, for example, and how this is something that runs really deep in ancient philosophy and mystic traditions. And it's something that I think now in a digital age, in an age of constant communication, constant entertainment, constant validation and dopamine hits that come from checking social media. It's something that that, that fear is really amplified. And, and to your question about how to work with it, particularly in a business setting, but also in a, in a home setting, could be among family or friends, one of the most important strategies beyond what, what Lee just shared is conversation. We just wrote an, a new article for Harvard Business Review about this, about how to build a culture that honors quiet time. Mm. And one of the most important parts of it is meeting with your team or meeting with your family and saying, hey, here's the ways I need more quiet time in my day. Or here's my wish that, for example, when we're brainstorming or maybe just when we're eating dinner, that we have a little bit more space, that we just honor the silence. This is important for me to be able to maintain my energy, to reset my nervous system, to encounter good ideas. And in brainstorming, for example, you know, and other types of creative problem solving in a group, it can be really valuable to bring pieces, you know, bring these elements of silence to imbue the conversation with a little bit of ma, for example, with just a period of not talking, or maybe a nonverbal report out, like with sticky notes up on the wall, or preserving the option to sleep on a question and revisit it the next day. Hmm. It would would it be along a, a continuum of silence, perhaps, to even say maybe during dinner with the family tomorrow, you're not going to have the television on or you're not going to have music playing at the same time. So mm -hmm. when there is speech, to your example, Lee, of either Ikebana flower arranging or the beautiful uh, scrolls, um, calligraphy, et cetera, that there's a lot of white space in them. You can see the individual flowers. You can see the individual characters because there's actually white space around it. It doesn't get muddied by the rest of that. So to the extent that you do have conversation at the table, you're not competing with the sound of the music or the news or whatever else is there. Am, am I on track with that or is this off? Oh, you're absolutely on track. And we really do encourage uh, readers to be you know, really tuning into their own lives. What is the noise of their lives? What is that, that that's kind of crowding the space? We look at auditory noise in particular. We look at informational noise, the mass proliferation of information that's available to us and grabbing for our attention now more and more aggressively all the mm -hmm. time, as well as what's our internal landscape. Um, what are the noises of our internal landscape? Where, where Are we filled with worry? Are we filled with rumination, filled with planning and dread or th th things like that, that internal landscape? So we're looking at noise on those various levels, trying to help um, our readers really distinguish what is the noise that's getting them. I, I want to go back and dig a little bit deeper into the the 
more tactical approaches of how to make the silence happen in two different contra- uh, contexts. One, and I think the most anxiety producing one for most people is when the uncomfortable silence, quote unquote, the awkward silence just s- shows up. It, it's never announced. You're in a meeting, you're in a conversation, you're doing whatever. And someone looks at you and says, you know, fill in this blank, talk now, answer this question. What do you think? Or you ask a question, to, then you're facilitating a, a meeting of some sort and you throw it to the group and there's nothing. Or the facilitator throws a question to the group and you're not the facilitator, you're just in the group, but no one responds. You don't necessarily have a response you want to give, but neither does anybody else. That's where the that palpable tension in the silence comes in. When that kicks in the adrenaline, that that little stomach knot of anxiety and awkward discomfort, what's an alternative? What can you do in that moment to keep yourself from needing to fill that silence or if necessary to fill somehow, what's a better way to do something? Yeah. I mean, one, I mentioned, Laura, that one of the inspirations for us in writing this book was to help shift our culture toward an appreciation of silence, including these awkward silences. So one thing in in these kinds of moments, which I know can be really tough, really difficult, really awkward, is to simply label it and say, hey, folks, I know this is awkward to sit in silence like this, but this can be a juicy moment. Sitting in silence together can be a moment in which we are really able to come to more understanding, able to go deeper into the process of creative thinking. Within the Quaker tradition, there is famously an emphasis on silence within worship, within their prayer service, but they also have business meetings. It's typically called a meeting for worship for the purpose of business, where they employ, the Quakers tend to employ the same work with silence in thinking about questions like you know, debating their annual budget, for example, for a center, or many of the Quaker centers have schools affiliated with them as they're making, you know, making business decisions. When things get tense, when things get heated, the person managing the meeting, who's usually called the clerk, will often call for a period of silence. And at first, like you're describing, that could be really awkward because people have things they want to say. People are in the heat of the debate and emotions may be running hot. But it's a deliberate strategy so that people can breathe, can check in, can really think about what the other person has been saying, really think about what they've been saying, really think about what they believe, and get closer to that discernment of what's really the truth. And we we speak with a, a very senior uh, executive in the business and nonprofit sectors who is a lifelong birthright Quaker, and he describes to us, and we describe this in the book, his process of when he's in one of these really difficult meetings and the clerk calls for silence, how his emotions often get intensified at first, and then it starts to calm And then he starts to feel more of a sense of union with the people in the room, even those with whom he's disagreed. And there's a kind of collective awareness that emerges through the silence. And he says, often someone then says exactly what he was going to say, and it emerges through the silence. Mm -hmm. So there's no easy answer to how to work with these awkward silences. But one thought, one thing that folks might say, that you might consider saying, is just, hey, I know this silence is uncomfortable. I know it's difficult. I know it's awkward. But there could be value if we take a minute, two minutes, three minutes, get in touch with the breath, breathe deeply, tune in to what we really want to say, tune into what others have been saying, and see if we can find some new solutions. See if we can let some new solutions emerge from the spaciousness. I think it's it's interesting because that's something you can also do to for yourself. If you're not in the uh, power role in the meeting, you're not the facilitator, you could be the lowest ranking person in that room. So maybe it's not up to you to dictate um, 
behaviors to the rest of the group. But if you know that your compulsion is to want to jump in, to even be able to say to yourself, I can say to myself, okay, that's just, I, I know I don't like the silence, but I'm acknowledging to myself consciously and explicitly, I may not like the silence, but that's okay. I'm just going to sit with it and not feel the, be the one to break the silence. I'm going to just breathe through it count to five, mm. count to 10 and see what happens. Um, the, it, so it sounds like it's something that you can do for yourself, even if you can't share with others. Absolutely. In fact, I think that's a great place to practice is actually to notice, you know, we might when we're in engaged, and I love that you're bringing up all these different types of scenarios and all these different times, you know, when we're maybe in different ranking positions or different times of comfort. When I worked with the teams on NASA, you, people didn't really say much until they'd been there, like in the double decades, you know, until mm. there's 20 years did people speak up. And you know, so there was a lot of being quiet and listening. But let's let's say we're in a really engaged meeting and our tendency is to want to fill, not just fill the space, but kind of be in that whole dialogue. What does it mean to just invite ourselves to step back and be more in a place of observation and listening, to be noticing what's being said, what's not being said, sort of some of the themes, those things, and then to perhaps speak from there, from that place of observation, of a little spaciousness, of listening, but to be working with our own capacities, our own habits and defaults, so that we're really honing and refining our own speech in that space and our comfort with silence and developing that respect that, that Justin was saying that appreciation for silence, for what it can really offer. Maybe it's just at, at first in our contributions, but then maybe it's more shared and you know maybe we're, we're noticing what happens on a team or in an organization when we invite in more silence. It can be more explicit with that as well. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've noticed and I, I reference it in my book as well, and I end up talking with, when I'm doing public speaking, training and coaching with clients, um, I don't have an actual statistic to back it up. So I'm curious if there is any um, number, any data you can share along these lines, but there's, um, I always tell people that when you're the one in the hot seat, in the spotlight and wherever it is, that silent, your perception of time is distorted. Oh. That what feels to you like an eternity of silence is probably less than a second. You know, there are teach. I'm, I'm my background is in teaching as a public school teacher, et cetera. Um, and one of the things we talk about is wait time, that when a teacher asks a, a question to the class, be, most teachers will say, oh, you know, I'll wait five to 10 seconds to see if someone wants to answer before I'll jump in and call on someone or give an example or paraphrase the question. And for years I was training teachers and I would have them do experiments where they would video or audio record themselves and uh, just to see when you ask a question on average, how long did you actually wait? And then when they were listening prior to breaking your own silence and they had to sit there with a stopwatch or a timer on the recording to see how long it was. And most people waited less than one full second before <laughs> jumping in. So if a student didn't automatically, whether they were kindergarten or high school or whatever it was, unless you finished asking the question and some kid automatically went, oh, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. That, you just assumed that you had way too much time because you inhaled. That should have been more than enough time for someone to, to start talking. So apparently they didn't understand or they can't answer it. So let me help. So is, is there, it, what do you, what data do you have or what can you share to that, to that, that tendency to grossly distort unintentionally, but where the brain distorts the perception of the duration of the silence. What, what do you know about that? What can you share? Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, we did through so many conversations and interviews in this book, including with neuroscientists and academic psychologists, as well as business people and different organizational leaders, find this theme that it's in the space of distorted time that you're talking about when you're in that jump right in reactive mode, which is often a fight or flight state. It's in that mode where mistakes are most often made. It's in that mode where we're most likely to say things that we'll regret or pursue ideas that really might not be the best idea. We spoke extensively with someone named Cyrus Habib, 
who was the son of Iranian immigrants to the U.S. He went blind when he was eight years old mm. because of a childhood illness. And then he taught himself Braille and ended up going to Columbia and Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and Yale Law School, became the lieutenant governor of Washington State when he was in his mid-30s. And everyone thought Cyrus was going to run for the U.S. Senate or run for governor. But he made an announcement about his next move and decided, told everyone that he was taking a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience as a novice Jesuit priest. And wow. everyone was shocked. And we talked with Cyrus while he's still in the lieutenant governor's office. And then we talked with him after. And in November of 2020, he did a month-long silent retreat to study some of the um, basic principles of being a Jesuit priest. And, um, and in the process, he discovered that his internal noise was just boisterous. He had cut out all of the noise and distraction in his world, in his life, in his work. He was literally in a silent retreat. And here he was dealing with this unbelievable amount of internal noise. So he looked at what was causing that. Why were things so noisy in his head, in his thoughts? And he realized it was a mindset of deriving his self-worth from how he appeared to other people and what he called an approach of performing to other people's expectations. And he said that the moment he got out of that mindset of performing, the moment he could realize that what he really wanted was to be exactly where he was in that moment, in the silence, in the contemplative space, that all of a sudden he could tune in to what he really wanted. And he felt his mind tune in to a want for truth. Whereas before, he felt his mind was so focused on that posturing, on that performance, that kind of distorted state that you're talking about, Laura, where you're in a meeting and everything is about defending and promoting a point of view, as opposed to really pursuing what's true. In the book, we look extensively at the, the life and story of Pythagoras, who a lot of people might remember from middle school math class, but was this extraordinary inventor, philosopher, leader of a mystery school in ancient Greece. And he required his inner circle of students to spend five years in silence if they wanted to study with him. And wow. we explained the reasoning there. And it was that he wanted his students' minds to be not in pursuit of performing to other people, not in pursuit of, you know, owning the room or winning the argument, but in pursuit of truth. And there's something that happens to the mind in deep silence that brings us like a compass tuning toward truth. That's mm -hmm. almost a scary proposition. The notion, well, five years of silence. Yes, that's utterly terrifying. I'll put that <laughs> right out there. But to us too, don't worry. <laughs> but the, the idea of the search for truth it, to the, almost to the exclusion of, or instead of the, the, I forget exactly how you phrased it, Justin, but you said it really concisely and pithily as opposed to trying to just promote an argument or, or a point or to, to prove your statement as right, the winning, especially when it is often done in zero sum rather than in, in collaboration and cooperation. Um, but the notion of putting aside all of that in, in search of a greater truth, I think that, um, I'm amazed that they let you speak in Congress and I'm thrilled because they clearly don't do this on a regular basis. So I think they need to let you back in a whole lot more frequently, like move in, put a cot in the main <laughs> atrium or something along those lines. Uh, so now, you know, we just have a couple more minutes and I really would like to, to get into the tactical suggestions so that people who are in the, I'm going to uh, be uh, direct and use the analogy of the rat race as far as just constant spinning the wheel, the hamster wheel, et cetera. So pick your, your animal and, and race of choice, but the for those who just are constantly running from noise to noise, conversation to conversation, meeting to meeting, and point to point, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that there are two major conditions and contexts that will determine um, what kind of power you have or don't have in finding and being able and allowed to 
utilize silence. To, and there are those contexts that are under your control, like when you are able to control your own calendar, when you are the one who calls the meeting, uh, et cetera, versus contexts that are not in your control, when you're just an attendee and you're the lowest ranking attendee, or um, you are not in control of your calendar. Anybody on your team can have access, can put space on it. You're not allowed to block time off. Uh, in each of those contexts, let's start with when you are in control. Um, you mentioned a few as far as as a facilitator to say, let's take some time here. But when you're not, aside from that, what are one or two, three things that you can do quickly to build silence into your personal and into your team and collective life. Yeah. Well, we do focus on this uh, quite a bit in the book. The whole second part of the book is looking at that. So love that sphere of control you highlighted and then the things that are outside of your control. And if we can imagine one more band in between the two, which is really your sphere of influence. So you may not have the final say, but you could start a conversation or you can, you know, perhaps uh, sway those around you to join you or to, you know, adapt. Um, but of course, we don't have control over others sometimes either. So anyway, so looking at those three rings, you could say. So we let the outside go, that which is out of our control. We let that go and, and focus instead on what's in our control and what's in our sphere of influence. And one of the ones we really love, the tips here, is we call it ma on the job, taking from that Japanese principle we were discussing. And um, that is really looking at the tiny micro moments of transition from one thing to another. Let's say one, one of the people we spoke with, super busy, works in Singapore. He talks about transitioning from even I'm working on one document, I'm opening another. So between that, he might just take a pause, take a breath. He moves between rooms as he places his hand on the on a doorknob to walk through and then it just pauses ever so slightly or even between you know drinks of water just really slowing down his transitions from one thing to the next now if we open that into more when we think about like padding a little bit more time between our meetings and our activities where we actually do have a few minutes to prepare for what's to come or maybe integrate what just occurred. So creating a little bit more padding spaciousness between our activities in a day can refresh just stepping outside into the rays of the sun for just a moment um, or walking around a little bit, getting, getting up and away from our desks. So those are some micro suggestions that most of us can find. We're not chained to a desk, right? We're not, <laughs> it's not every living. So really to think about those and really go as deeply as you can into those moments. They're tiny, but they can really do the trick. And we're saying this as people with, you know, young children and full lives. And we're really, we've really been studying in these past five years, how deeply one can go into those micro moments that we have between. Yeah. What it's like that, Justin? Healthy, we think of it as the healthy successor to the smoke break. It's a good thing that people don't smoke cigarettes and, you know, most people don't smoke cigarettes anymore, but it's like something was lost when people no longer have these little moments to just step outside and breathe. You know, is it possible rather than the, the medicine in those moments being the nicotine or whatever is causing that rush, of the, <laughs> inhaling the cigarette, go to the medicine of silence to just step outside and take some moments in silence, kind of a healthy successor to the smoke break. You know, and there's also, to, to your question, Laura, there's also the deeper and more immersive experience. We look at ideas for how to take a day like Gandhi would spend his Mondays, say to take a wordless Wednesday. That's not within everyone's sphere of control, certainly. One thing we look at is occasionally, maybe once a quarter or even once a year, do something we call take your to-do list for a hike which is to say you print out your to-do list or bring it with you if it's written down and go to the most remote place you can go to in nature that you could reasonably access, a pond or a forest or a quiet beach or a mountain overlook. And when you get there, take a little bit of time to center yourself, recalibrate your senses, feel like your nerves have settled, put your phone away, and then take out your to-do list. And from that place of silence, Cross out everything that's not really necessary. 
We look at the example of, of someone who's an acoustic ecologist in the Pacific Northwest who taught us this and said that in this practice, he gets to a really remote place. And one time recently, he was able to cross off about four or five months worth of professional commitments off his to-do list simply because he got to a place, a vantage point, where he realized those things didn't matter. So he crossed off four to five months worth of to-do list? Yeah. That's right. And those That's... were all things that looked important at his desk at home. But once he got to that place of deep silence and thought about what really mattered in his life, he realized those things weren't important. That's like Mr. Clean Magic Eraser for your life. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> right. And he probably, you know, thought I don't have that time, you know, but he took a day and he got back five months. That is amazing ROI. If the stock market performed that well, we would all be able to retire very, very early. Uh, so, okay. Then, and I like the notion that just the concept of the healthy successor to the smoke break, because what it makes me think of is that, you know, with smoking, it's not just the nicotine that people are looking for, but part of what makes that uh, relaxing is that you're actually taking a deep, full breath. There's a long, slow, drawn out, labored inhale, and then usually holding that breath for a couple of seconds, and then taking a slow exhale and letting it out entirely. We don't do that. So mm -hmm. it seems like you could mime the smoke break effectively, even if it's just you know, 15 seconds here and there to pick up a pen or just put your fingers up as if holding the cigarette and take that long, deep, slow breath, hold it, count of five, 10 seconds, whatever you want, and then let it all go. Let your body relax and just allow that to be your silence break for a moment. Am I nuts? Oh, no, you're not nuts. We have a whole chapter on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nuts. And so I'm not part of that chapter. Okay. <laughs> you, you, yeah, just it, it's really, we, it's a real hole in, in our work day now to not have that. And it, we, in fact, we, those who do smoke, I think they now look at their phones. So there's, you know, it's like things have changed, but still, what is the equivalent to what once was that deep inhale, deep exhale, and really resetting throughout the day, many times throughout the day. So what do we do now for that? Yes, yes, that's terrific. So there's lots of great little examples. And you know, the big idea, take the whole day, take the Mondays, take whatever. Those are fabulous. Hey, anybody can set those as a, if, if anyone out there can muscle their way through their life and find that time, great, highly recommend it. But even those little microseconds, those little micro transitions, there's something in this conversation for everybody. So we really want to challenge everyone out there to just find a few seconds every day. Silence here and there. Start with the seconds. Build up to a minute, maybe even two, whether at the same time or not, but I bet you can do it. So that is my challenge for all of you out there. Justin and Lee, is there anything you'd like to give the audience or anything you would like to invite the audience to check out, places that they can find out more about you and the book? Well, the book you can buy pretty much anywhere, but HarperCollins is our U.S. publisher, and in the U.K. it's Penguin. Uh, so take a look for that, Golden, The Power of Silence in a World of Noise. And then we can be found at Astrea Strategies, that's A-S-T-R-E-A, -E strategies.com, and you'll find a way to contact us there and all the work we're doing, and we'd love for you to reach out. Terrific. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with us as opposed to sitting in silence. Hopefully everyone else will take a few seconds afterwards just to digest, process, and work with a little bit. Let some of the wisdom of that you shared with us today sink in and hopefully apply it immediately thereafter, as a matter of fact. So thank you so much for joining us today, both of thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to everybody else, once again, for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and your other platforms of choice so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, be sure to go to uh, speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. 
Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.